Okay. Um, one of the things that's very critical for us as emergency managers is to understand the science and technology so that we can perform our jobs. So what I hope to do today is to define emergency management and the role of emergency managers, uh, talk about some generational changes in the field that I've seen uh, over the course of my career, uh, emphasize the importance of, emergency, of uh, engineering and science, and also what emergency managers need from scientists and engineers in a very general way. Okay, emergency management is the discipline and profession of applying science, technology, planning, and management to deal with extreme events that can injure or kill large numbers of people due to ex also uh, do extensive damage to property and disrupt community life. The emergency manager is a person who has day-to-day -day responsibility for emergency management programs and activities. And these activities include planning, mitigation, warning, response, and recovery from extreme events. The definition of emergency manager that I use prevails in the United States, but emergency managers may be called civil protection agencies, they might be called civil defense in other countries. Um, so these are the, the variations. I think sometimes you associate emergency management with government. And of course, government does include emergency managers, but the private sector does as well. So there are emergency managers both in the public and private sectors. So some of the major changes I've seen over the course of my career, and, and will be important, I think, in this talk, the, the, the profession has, has undergone uh, great changes in terms of certification. There are now uh, degree programs, baccalaureate programs in emergency management in a number of different countries. Um, they're also changing assumptions about communities and disasters. After World War II, the prevailing model of disaster management or emergency management was to look at the community and disaster as chaotic. Uh, as there was a kind of war model, and that was that a community is completely disrupted. The agencies of social control are no longer uh, in charge. Uh, people are dependent. Uh, people are uh, entirely at the mercy of the authorities who must come in and exercise control over the community. And that definition is very much changed. Uh, we now see communities as resourceful, as resilient. Um, one of the things that I did after the uh, great uh, Hanshin Awaji Kobe earthquake, uh, I came back to Japan a number of times with a grant from our National Science Foundation to look at the response uh, in that earthquake, the res looking at the response agencies and also looking at the community. One of the things that impressed me was that there were 20,000 live rescues in that earthquake. Only 5,000 of those 20,000 can be attributed to the self-defense forces and search and rescue teams. The other 15,000 rescues were done by family, friends, and strangers who simply knew that they had to respond. So we look at communities very differently now, more as partners than something that has to be controlled. The other thing is diversification from single to multi-hazard focus. Uh, at the beginning of my career, we kind of pigeonholed ourselves into earthquakes, tsunamis, landslides, volcanic hazards. But I think uh, there gradually became a more multi-hazard focus uh, over this period of time. And I think that was really uh, very useful. As the students in Group B pointed out, uh, there are many aspects to a natural disaster. Uh, my colleague, Anna Maria Cruz at Kyoto University, uh, has developed a concept of NATEC, and that is natural disasters that trigger technological disasters. 
chemical spills, nuclear accidents, and a variety of other things. So we very much uh, now look at the commonality of what disasters have in common rather than this uh, single-minded focus. We've also become much more proactive. Earlier, most of the social policy that governed how we deal with disasters occurred after something had occurred. Um, for example, we had an earthquake in the Los Angeles area in 1933 in Long Beach. Uh, many of the old unreinforced masonry schools collapsed. Fortunately, it was not during uh, school hours. But after that, legislation was passed that schools had to be resistant to earthquakes. So much of our policy has been like that, but I think now they're much more proactive approaches uh, which I'll get into a little bit later. So what do we need? What do we as an emergency managers need from, the, uh, from our engineering and science? Well, first of all, we need empirically grounded scenarios and real-time loss estimates. Um, scenario development and loss estimation have really greatly benefited uh, emergency management. It gives us a good idea of where it's going to happen, how big it's going to be, how frequent it is, and what we're going to have to do. Um, one of the things that's been very helpful to us in the United States is a program called HAZUS. And basically, it is a program, a software program, that gives us loss estimates given uh, an, an earthquake, a flood, or um, uh, a wind scenario. So, it gives us an idea of what kind of medical response that we'll have to mobilize. Um, it tells us how many search and rescue teams we'll need. Uh, it tells us a variety of things about how many uh, shelters, how many, uh, you know, what kind of recovery planning we need to do. So this has been a development that's really, really useful. But loss estimation depends on the quality of the algorithms that predict these various parameters, and they have to be refined, and we have to have updated databases. Populations move, uh, infrastructure changes, and so these models have to be updated all the time. Uh, we also have benefited and need uh, improvements in long-term forecasting. Um, we need to know, much like the scenario here for the non chi trough earthquake, where are the long-term prospects of a major natural disaster so that we can focus our attention, focus our resources, and uh, prepare that area. Um, and finally, I think we need kind of ongoing advice uh, from engineers and scientists during an evolving uh, a natural hazard sequence to keep us on track to make sure that we understand uh, the environment in which uh, we're responding. The other thing I think is appreciate the contributions of social scientists to uh, natural hazard uh, uh, risk reduction. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have a very changed understanding of community uh, disaster response. Does anyone see a uniform in here? This is the community responding to the disaster. These people are probably survivors themselves, and this is how communities respond. Usually, the first responders are the people who are actually the, the survivors of the event. Um, social scientists can also uh, contribute to more effective warning messages. Uh, one of the things that we're developing on the west coast of the United States and has been in effect in Japan for a lengthy period of time is earthquake early warning. Now these warning messages have to be very short because the warning is very short, maybe seconds to tens of seconds. So what do you say in a very short period of, of, of opportunity in order, to receive, in order to trigger the kind of response you want from the population? Also, uh, social scientists have contributed uh, immensely to improve the mental health of survivors, 
to understand and approve, improve uh, evacuation planning, uh, evaluate uh, and understand uh, and implement preparedness and mitigation measures, uh, more effective strategies for community engagement, and incorporating behavioral aspects into loss modeling. Also, understanding differences regarding uncertainty. Scientists and engineers are always trying to reduce uncertainty and increase the probability uh, of the estimates and, uh, and the predictions they make. Um, and probabilistic assessments, as you know, are part of science. But sometimes there arise difference in the way in which probabilities are interpreted by emergency managers versus scientists. And an example is recently uh, there's been a very significant debate in the seismological journals about something called operational earthquake forecasting. Earthquakes cannot be predicted with any high degree of probability. However, there are certain precursory earthquake activity, uh, moderate size earthquakes, swarms, uh, other kinds of uh, seismic anomalies that may indicate the probability uh, of a follow-on earthquake has increased. Now, one of the, well, well the, the good example is the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami. There were three magnitude six earthquakes and a magnitude 7.4 on March 9th. There was also uh, a very large aseismic uh, event that was picked up on the uh, GPS network. Now, a lot of scientists would say these are not actionable. The probability may only be five or 10 percent over a few days that an earthquake uh, or other event may occur. But to us in emergency management, that can give us a very important leg up, as we say, on preparing. We can move resources. We can activate emergency operations centers. Perhaps we would uh, like to move very vulnerable populations uh, out of areas that might be inundated or shaken very hard. So these are things that are differences, but still we need to uh, evaluate those you know, in the context of, uh, of not only emergency management and science, but also public safety. <clears throat> Okay, we need also knowledge transfer. Um, emergency managers rarely read the journals in which engineers and scientists publish. And funding agencies now require that there be some kind of, uh, of mechanism for transferring knowledge uh, that are funded by the public to those who might be able to use it. But I think there's also uh, maybe a need for translators, not necessarily scientists or social scientists, but people who can communicate uh, new knowledge and new technologies to the public. There's also a very critical need for knowledge and technology transfer uh, from the developed to the, the developed to the developing world. <clears throat> We also need some new bold cooperative initiatives. Uh, global climate change is rapidly changing our planet. Um, it's literally a global man-made uh, disaster that requires our immediate attention. And I think that scientists and engineers and emergency managers have to speak with one voice uh, to overcome a very complacent status quo. Uh, as you know, uh, being in this field, Climate change is going to result in much more frequent and severe natural disasters. Um, and so some of these uh, bold initiatives that I'm talking about involve the movement of communities. After the Wenchuan earthquake in 2008, the government of China didn't rebuild Bishuan City in the area that uh, it was located, but moved it 23 kilometers away to an area that was safer. To have simply rebuilt in that area would have left that city vulnerable to, uh, again, landslides 
and very strong ground motion uh, from earthquakes in that area. Also, <clears throat> uh, in Canada and the United States, there have been residential buyouts. Uh, actually, the government will come in, offer uh, a particular uh, amount of money, uh, hopefully uh, that would cover the cost of another house to move elsewhere. And those communities are gradually being moved. So those are some of the, <clears throat> some of the, uh, uh, some of the, the new uh, initiatives that I, I see uh, coming. Also, um, New Zealand has a building rating system uh, and the, the worst 30% of their buildings are now tagged. That, that indicate, the tags indicate that this building may not be safe in an earthquake. So that's another thing that, uh, you know, that I think that can be implemented. But there are very strong vested interests against those kinds of, uh, of moves. So we'll see. Um, and I think finally, we need respect from the disciplines of engineering and science, and we have to work together. Um, these disciplines operate in different organizational cultures uh, with different training, different reward structures, uh, and expectations. And sometimes there's a tendency for these professions to view one another through the prism of stereotypes. And this is really not productive at all. Last week, uh, I was at an earthquake conference in New Zealand, and we were greeted by the indigenous population, a small group of uh, members of the Maori. They welcomed us, they sent us off, and left us with what they called the three R's. And that was the critical uh, need, the critical concept for people to cooperate and collaborate. And it was recipro reciprocity, relationship, and respect. And with that, I'll thank you. <laughs> thank you.